2024 presidential contender and undiagnosed sociopath Vivek Ramaswamy recently performed Lose Yourself by Eminem at the Iowa State Fair, and he described it as his favorite campaign walkout song. Fast forward to today, and we're now learning that Eminem's attorney actually sent him a cease and desist and demanded that he stop using his music, which I find absolutely hilarious. Now, for those of you not keeping track, this isn't the first time that a Republican politician got a cease and desist from an artist, because back in January, Dr. Dre actually sent Marjorie Greene a cease and desist after she used one of his songs in a video, and literally dozens of artists have objected to Trump's use of their songs at campaign events. So, I mean, to be safe, I think that Republicans should just assume that all musicians hate them and use royalty-free music like us YouTubers. Now, this story kind of got me down a rabbit hole of sorts when it comes to Vivek Ramaswamy, and I found out something that was so disturbing to me that it shook me to my core. Am I being a little bit hyperbolic? Yes. But listen, I have to, I just, I have to share this with you. So the reason why he's a fan of Eminem is because he used to fancy himself as a bit of a rapper himself, and not just any rapper. He used to be a libertarian rapper. I'm not fucking kidding about this. So as Politico explains, during his time as an undergrad at Harvard, Ramaswamy had a side hustle as a libertarian-minded rap artist who went by the stage name Devek. The gig was an early sign of the extroverted, self-assured personality that has propelled him far further in the primary than virtually anyone expected. Quote, I saw myself honestly making it big through American capitalism, and that's why the Eminem story spoke to me, Ramaswamy, now 37 years old, said in an interview. A friend who watched him rap at some point in his 20s provided footage of it. And I've got good news, my friends. The footage is available. Now, unfortunately, I can't play it for you because he's singing Lose Yourself by Eminem, which is a copyrighted song. But if you follow the link to that Politico article, I'll link to it down below, it's at the top of the page. And I need all of you to do this. Just pause this video, go watch that, and come back because it is mind-boggling to me. And I say this because it's impressive in the sense of how bad it is. Like, you have to try to be this bad because throughout the entirety of this 30-second clip, he is completely out of sync with the music to the point where he speeds up, but then he goes a little bit too fast, so then he has to slow down. So he's going at different tempos throughout the song, and he's doing all of that while he can't really control his breathing, and he sounds like shit. And it is genuinely one of the most cringiest things I've ever seen. And when you also take into account the fact that he fashioned himself as a libertarian rapper, it is almost too much for me to handle. And <laughs> the extent to which he lacks rhythm is astounding to me. It's just, it's shocking. So I would highly encourage you to check it out, but be warned, it is, uh, it's hard to watch, but it's like a train wreck. You're not going to want to look away. But back to Eminem cease and desist, uh, which I find hilarious, but not surprising because as Tori Auden of the New Republic puts it, it shouldn't be surprising that Eminem opposes Ramaswamy using his music. The rapper has long made his political stances clear. He released the protest song against George W. Bush in 2004 that criticized the then president for invading Iraq and Afghanistan in the wake of 9-11. In 2017, Eminem wrote a song in support of the Black Lives Matter movement and released a freestyle rap railing against Donald Trump's morals, policies, and racist behavior. Exactly. So it's a little bit weird that Vivek would think that Eminem would approve of his use of his music in the first place, considering that Eminem has made it very clear that he hates Donald Trump. And Vivek, on the other hand, is one of, if not the biggest Donald Trump bootlickers in the country, which is bizarre, considering that he's literally competing against Trump in a GOP primary. But I mean, that makes a lot more sense when you consider that Vivek isn't running to win. He's running for second place and is desperately hoping that Trump picks him to be, to be his running mate. But I want to show you what I mean by that, right? Because I'm not just insulting him and calling him a Trump bootlicker because I'm trying to be mean, even though I think it's fine to be mean to people like Vivek Ramaswamy, who are just genuinely terrible people. But in an interview with uh, Chuck Todd on Meet the Press, so he was talking about this, right? And over the weekend, he went on basically a media tour and it seemed like he was trying to speed run dumb fuck comments but there's one clip in particular that i want to show you and there's others here but this one he talks about how mike pence didn't handle january 6th correctly so do you remember how trump was telling mike pence to not certify the election because he wanted him to steal it for him well essentially ramaswamy is saying well you know if i were in mike pence's position i would have done what trump asked me to which 
is not something that he can do. But I'm going to let you hear how he says he would have did Trump uh, would have done Trump's bidding here. This is so fucking mind boggling to me. Most of the candidates on stage Wednesday night said Mike sure. Pence did the right thing on January 6th. Do you agree? I would have done it very differently. I think that there was a historic opportunity that he missed to reunite this country in that window. What I would have said is this is a moment for a true national consensus where there's two elements of what's required for a functioning democracy in America. One is secure elections, and the second is a peaceful transfer of power. When those things come into conflict, that's an opportunity for heroism. Here's what I would have said. We need single day voting on election day. We need paper ballots and we need government issued ID matching the voter file. And if we achieve that, then we have achieved victory and we should not have any further complaint about election integrity. So what would, so what I would, would have you driven have done it through the Senate? So what would you have done as, with Mike Pence? You would have so not capacity, certified the election? So in, in my capacity as president of the Senate, I would have led through that level of reform. Then on that condition, certified the election results, served it up to the president. Yeah. President Trump then to sign that into law. And on January 7th, declared the re-election campaign pursuant to a free and fair election. So in other words, he would refuse to certify the election, pass electoral reform within a day, and then redo the entire election in order to appease Donald Trump. Oh, okay, well, isn't that convenient? You don't like the election, so you change the conditions and then you ask for a redo. That's not authoritarian at all. But I mean, first of all, he would not do this because you wouldn't be able to pass reform within one day. That's not that's not possible. Do you see how D.C. functions? They can't get shit done. So they're not going to do that. And Democrats certainly wouldn't go along with that. Second of all, again, he is specifically pretending that he would be better than Mike Pence because he wants to be Trump's new number two. That's what this is about. But what makes his comments especially interesting here is the fact that he was saying something very different about the 2020 election not that long ago. And thankfully, Chuck Todd called him out on this. In your book, which wasn't written that long ago, um, you wrote the fact that all of our governmental institutions so unanimously found no evidence of significant fraud is telling. Furthermore, I've talked to many Republicans at all levels of government, and not one has ever presented convincing evidence that the 2020 election was stolen from President Trump. Very few have seriously tried. I don't believe that most Republican politicians actually think the election was stolen. So you went from there, so let, let me address and this. 11 months later, your views have changed on January 6th. Again, this book was written September yeah, of 2022. Chuck, I'm happy to address that if, you, if you're interested. Yeah. Yeah, so and read exactly that chapter in the book. I drew a sharp distinction between what I did see as the interference in the election that mattered, which was interference by big tech. I'm data driven. There's hard data showing that many voters, many independent voters would have changed their result enough to influence the outcome of the election yeah. if they had been exposed to what we now know to be the truth about the Hunter Biden laptop story. By contrast, I've also been clear. I have not yet seen evidence that there was ballot fraud of a scale that would have changed that result. I'm just responding to data on both fronts. OK, so that makes total sense to me. The election was stolen, but in the sense that voters would have all changed their minds and voted for Trump instead of Biden if they saw pictures of Hunter Biden's nine inch cock. That laptop was make or break. It wasn't Trump's handling of covid or four years of buffoonery. It was the laptop. Everyone would have changed their minds. That's the profound impact that that laptop would have had made total sense. I mean, this is idiotic thinking, and there's no way he believes this, right? It's stupid, but I don't think that he's stupid enough to actually believe this. But this man is a liar, right? It reminds me of how he said that climate change was real just a couple of years ago in a CBS interview. But then at the debate, he said the climate change agenda is a hoax. I mean, he claims to be an outsider, but he's more slippery than any politician you see in D.C. They're at least more skilled when they use doublespeak and weasel words. But with him, like, he oozes smarmy and slimy behavior that just makes people hate politics. Now, during that same interview, he said that he could appeal to young people because he's young himself. That's his argument. Meanwhile, he proposed raising the voting age to 25. So mm, I don't think young voters are going to be lining up to vote for you when you're saying that you want to disenfranchise them. But I actually want to move on to a different interview that he did, because uh, when he was asked about a neo-Nazi shooting in Jacksonville, Florida, 
Um, just listen to how Weasley he was in the way that he talked about this. It was very disingenuous. This should not be happening in the United States of America, and it is wrong. The reality is we have a mental health epidemic in this country. There are reports that this particular individual, the perpetrator, was indeed evaluated for mental health deficiencies as well. And I think we need to have to have the courage in this country to bring back a practice of putting back psychiatrically ill people who pose a risk to their communities into psychiatric institutions, not just drugging them up, but faith-based approaches and other approaches. Mental health is one aspect of, of these shootings. And apparently, and we're still learning uh, a lot about uh, what happened, the, the facts are still coming out. Uh, also, this was very much apparently racially motivated. Uh, the sheriff there said point blank that this shooter had, uh, had manifestos coming, three manifestos, and said specifically that he went to this dollar store with the intent of killing black people. I think that is heinous and deserves to be called out for what it is. The reality is we've created such a racialized culture in this country in the last several years that right as the last few burning embers of racism were burning out, we have a culture in this country largely created by media and establishment and universities and politicians that throw kerosene on that racism. And I can think of no better way to fuel racism in this country than to take something away from other people on the basis of their skin color. I've been saying that for years. And I think that is driving, sadly, a new wave of anti-black and anti-Hispanic racism in this country. I think the right way Sir, forward is, it, is, is, if we want to stop hate and discrimination on the basis of race, let's stop discriminating on the basis of race and see what unites us as Americans. Because I, I do not think this kind of racial division and any division is good for us as the United States. In other words, the real racists are the people who are trying to stop racism. And racism was actually almost gone until historically marginalized groups demanded equality. Had they not gotten too loud, then I guess that, you know, the racists wouldn't have come back out in full force. That is insane. But that's his response to a neo-Nazi shooter who targeted black people. This is a presidential candidate, just to remind you. Now, he just can't address that element of this story specifically so he tries to skirt around it and tap dance around around that and he'll bring up mental health but the reason why he didn't address white supremacy head-on is because his whole shtick has been to pretend that racism doesn't exist like this is literally what he just said i've never once encountered that yet i'm sure the I'm sure the boogeyman white supremacist exists somewhere in America. I've just never met him. <laughs> never seen one. Never met one in my life, right? Maybe I'll meet a, uh, maybe I'll meet a unicorn sooner. And, and maybe those exist too. So just because somebody hasn't encountered one doesn't mean that the notion of white supremacy doesn't exist as a threat in America. What do you think goes through the minds of the families of the three victims in yesterday's shooting when they hear you say that white supremacy is basically a fantasy? I'm sure they're grieving for their loss and I don't wanna politicize those victims. Dana, this is a very sensitive situation where we should have nothing but foremost respect for those victims and not bring them into partisan politics. But I was responding to a question where someone asked me, what, have I, what racism have I experienced in recent years? And I answered honestly, most of that racism has come from the modern left. It's happening during the course of this campaign. Kara Swisher calling me Rama Smarmy the other day and reveling in, in making twists of my last name. People effectively reducing me to the color of my skin and my attributes. That comes today from the modern left. So the only bigotry that he's experienced comes from the left, according to him. Now, I find that unbelievable because maybe he hasn't seen it, but conservatives have been extremely bigoted when it comes to his religion. He is a Hindu American, and religious liberty is something that conservatives claim to care a lot about. So my question to Vivek is, maybe you haven't seen it, but it's still happening. Got anything to say about Ron DeSantis' super PAC using your religion in opposition research? Or how about right-wing preacher Abby Johnson warning Christians to not vote for you specifically because of your Hindu faith? There's a man who is gaining traction right now as the presidential nominee and 
His name is Vivek Ramaswamy, and he is Hindu. And those who are Hindu believe in many gods. And he speaks well, and he is very charismatic, and he says the right things. He says so many right things. Sometimes I'm like, maybe he is the right guy, but he's not because our God will not be mocked. Do not be a victim of Satan's confusion right now. So there's that. Meanwhile, he's pretending that all the discrimination that he's experienced comes from the left. It's the old Dave Rubin tactic, right? Where you claim that the right is actually more tolerant. Meanwhile, they're screaming in your face bigotry. I mean, Dave Rubin was accused of being a kidnapper when he announced that he and his husband were having kids, but yet he still claims that the right is more tolerant. This is what the GOP does. It's the oldest trick in the book, right? They use marginalized people to attack other marginalized people because that's how you legitimize the GOP's hate. Now, if you watch both of these interviews with Vivek, you're going to lose brain cells, so I wouldn't recommend it because the more he speaks, the more unhinged he reveals himself to be. And it's impressive that he can say so many stupid things all while sounding super smart, right? But because he says it in a smart way, well, people take him seriously. It's kind of the Ben Shapiro effect, right? He just said on breaking points that he wouldn't rule out sending the U.S. military to Mexico to take on cartels. Like, we're in a situation where GOP candidates who are doing well are openly saying, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to invade Mexico. It's so insane that this is the state of the modern Republican Party, which is one of two electorally viable parties in this country. How sad is that? Yeah, but back to Eminem. Because uh, I think that this cease and desist is uh, is awesome. It's not necessarily the most substantive political news story, but when you have an opportunistic, slimy politician who is saying deeply stupid and dangerous things, I think it's okay for us to find joy in the schadenfreude when uh, his idol gives him the finger. I think that's great. And I think that we don't have to be ashamed to laugh at stories like this because it, it's well-deserved. Fuck this guy. Vagina. 